hi all uh, i'm alireza and uh, um, you can also see tommy who's my co-presenter today so uh, langdon you're here langdon uh, should we just start self moderate okay yes so uh, i am a phd student at boston university working with professor oran krieger and i am also a research intern at red hat working with some very smart people whose names you can see on the screen and i'm in the wrong window okay so so the structure of today's general purpose operating systems is not suitable for a number of today's key use cases in the cloud uh, client workloads are typically run inside dedicated virtual machines a general purpose operating system designed to multiplex resources among many users and processes is instead being replicated across many single user often single process virtual machines so uh, that's a general purpose operating system running a single application workload and if anybody has a, a question please uh, ask me i'm not actually looking at the chat so tommy if you can do that sure will do also uh, so uh, to continue applications that require high performance io use frameworks like dpdk and spdk to bypass the kernel and gain unimpeded access to hardware devices so the general purpose operating system is actually coming in the way of performance sensitive workloads clearly uh, for some use cases the general purpose operating system is too general and there is a need for specialized operating system here uh, which are optimized for each specific workload in response to these questions there has been a resurgence of research exploring the idea of library operating systems or unikernels in a unikernel uh, an application is statically linked with a specialized kernel and deployed directly on hardware uh, it can be virtual or physical the application runs in a single address space with the kernel and other user libraries uh, there is no separation between the uh, uh, operating system and application privilege levels Unikernels have shown to be uh, small and lightweight as compared to normal kernels, and they allow application-specific optimizations. And there are actually uh, many unikernels already uh, available. For example, ABRT, Include OS, Mirage OS, uh, OS, and many others. When compared with Linux, these unikernels have demonstrated significant advantages in both uh, in in uh, not bo uh, both but in actually all of these. Uh, for example, boot time, security, resource utilization, and I/O performance. Uh, for example, uh, with ABRT, you get more than twice improved uh, memcached throughput as compared to Linux, and Ling's entire website, which runs on Ling uh, Unikernel, takes only 25 MB of memory. Unfortunately, despite all these tremendous advantages, Unikernels have not achieved widespread adoption. One might find the reason for this in how these Unikernels are developed. For example, some are developed from scratch, uh, and some are developed by forking an already existing code base. and stripping it down to create a small lightweight specialized kernel uh, both of these approaches result in a separate code base and uh, then that needs to be maintained this uh, obviously this new code base is not as well tested as uh, something like linux these unikernels don't have sufficient functionality to run a broad class of applications that are mostly limited to only virtualized environments they do not support accelerators for example gpus and fpgas that are fundamental for modern high uh, performance applications and often only run a single processor uh, core uh, so you can say that unikernels are just too niche and perhaps the most concerning reason is that uh, no unikernel has attracted a large community of developers uh, which makes it more uh, difficult that uh, and unlikely that these challenges will be addressed anytime soon so we asked ourselves a question can we do unikernels differently would it be possible to create a unikernel out of linux which can then be upstreamed so that the whole community can work on it uh, we were not sure if the changes required to turn linux into a unikernel would be so extensive that it would be difficult to merge it upstream uh, we were not sure that even if we were able to do that will the advantages that research unikernels have demonstrated will we be able to get those uh, uh, those advantages and the biggest question of all the the most important question is it even possible we didn't know that so we started uh, out on this research direction uh the main goal uh, so i'll talk about uh, ukl and its different versions that have uh, that we've created over the over the time we've been working on this uh the main goal of the first version was to get something running to see if the idea even worked we compiled uh, the application code separately and then linked everything together in a kernel uh, in the kernel linking stage so the final vm linux binary that we got was actually a unikernel we had to modify the kernel linker script to add sections which are not part of the linux uh, uh, code base traditionally uh, but are important part of application binaries for example the thread local storage sections 
we also had to modify the boot up process a bit so that when the VM Linux elf is loaded into memory, those new sections are also loaded. Uh, this might seem straightforward, but it was anything but that. Uh, mostly what you see on your screen was the state of the project. Uh, we spent months trying to figure out these things, investigating why things did not work and trying different uh, fixes. Uh, thankfully, I had really good mentors and advisors and things just kept on rolling. Uh, in order to get something functional, we took the most straight, straightforward approach. We stopped the first exec VE call, so user space was never created. We called our application code directly here, uh, but we couldn't just run application code directly because we were still a K thread. Applications need glibc to do some initialization. First, for example, the P thread uh, struct should be placed right next to the thread local storage uh, and uh, the, the, the threads FS register should be pointing at that. All of these uh, initializations, uh, like the one that I just described and many others, can be found in the paper that you can see on your screen, uh, written by Ulrich Tripper, who also wrote the uh, NPTEL or the pthread library, and is also a mentor on this uh, project. The funny thing about this, uh, this paper is that I read it in order, in, in, in order to get these, uh, understand these initializations and get them to work, I read this paper at least 10 times. Uh, and every time I learned something totally new, which I had completely missed earlier. So if, so I suggest if you want to read this paper, uh, read it a few times. Uh, uh, before we could do glibc related initializations, we had to modify the K thread to look more like an application thread. This involved modifying the task struct, uh, the flags, modifying the MM struct so uh, that the thread could see the lower half of the address, address space so that MMAP and uh, break calls could work. Uh, uh, but, uh, on, sorry, so on this very first thread, we were still running on a kernel stack. We realized this very early when we were starting, uh, when we started running out of stack. Uh, so in order to not run out of stack on that first K thread, we called P thread create very early so that we jumped onto a clean application stack and a clean new thread to run the application. And it was, it, it, it felt really good to see the first hello world on screen after almost a year of work. In order to uh, change the syscalls uh, into function calls, we took the simplest approach. We created our own UK library, which had stubs for all syscalls. Uh, so instead of calling write, the application would call UKL underscore write, uh, or actually glibc would call uh, UKL underscore write. This stub uh, would directly in then invoke the internal kernel, kernel functionality. Since we were missing all of the kernel entry and exit code, uh, but at that moment, because this was still an idea and getting to a proof of concept was much more important, we, we uh, rolled with it. We conducted experiments by running a simple TCP echo server as a unikernel to see how we were doing against normal Linux and also uh, got a vision paper accepted at hot OS 2019. Uh, as you can see on your screen, the UKL echo server had a better average and tail latency as compared to normal Linux. This, uh, this result, was not important because of the numbers that it showed. It was important for us because A, it showed that yes, this is something that could be done and B, yes, there are some performance gains and we should keep exploring this idea further. So that brings us to uh, version two because now we knew that yes, it could work. So uh, we started writing everything again uh, and we uh, started working on version two. We needed the entire glibc and pthreads library uh, code to run if we wanted to run anything more than the toy applications we had run earlier. We went through the entire kernel entry and exit code and, in, and investigated what was necessary and needed to run in UKL. We were still running the UKL stub library, which I discussed earlier. And uh, so we added our own kernel entry and exit functions in each stub. These functions called some parts of the actual kernel uh, code for entry and exit. But uh, we could not just uh, use the entire uh, entry and exit code uh, as it is because that code assumed that the registers were already on the stack. And we did not have that set up. And in order to get that to work, we would have to do major changes uh, in the way that we were doing things. Uh, and at that point, we were changing glibc manually in every file wherever syscall was made, we would go and change the code uh, so that it called a UKL stub. And in order to get the, all the entry and exit code to work, we would have to change all of that uh, because we would have to then change the stub library. So uh, for version two, we got glibc fully functional, uh, which 
as you can uh, imagine, in, uh, involved a lot of debugging. Uh, we also got the NPTEL or the pthread library fully functional. A great help with that was the unit tests written by Ulrich Prepper. As part of the NPTEL library, we ran all those and fixed problems as they came up. We were still doing all the initializations ourselves. Uh, that we did for version one, we modify, uh, which you know, uh, as I discussed earlier, that mod uh, include involved modifying the task struct and mm struct just enough that glibc initializations could work. After glibc initializations, we called pthread create to run the application on uh, a proper uh, user stack. Uh, when we entered the kernel for any kernel functionality, we were not switching stacks to a kernel stack because uh, no ring transition ever happened. So we uh, we remained on the same user stack throughout. Uh, we investigated and solved a whole a bunch of different problems in version two, and I will talk about a couple of them. Uh, running multiple threads in UKL, we saw that application threads were never preempted, and uh, any other thread waiting to be scheduled in would never get the chance. The problem uh, fixed itself if we turned the kernel preemption config option on. Thankfully, uh, one of our mentors, Daniel, who's also from Red Hat, he jumped in to help. The problem was that the kernel entry and exit code was not being executed on return from interrupts because we were always in ring zero. Uh, due to this, the scheduler was never called. So Daniel uh, wrote a, a, a patch which handled this special case for us uh, for application threads and made sure that the scheduler, scheduler was called when we were on our way back to application code. The other problem uh, we fixed was that some of our page faults resulted in double faults. Normally, when a page fault occurs, as you all know, you jump to a kernel stack to service that, that fault. The switch never occurred in UKL because no rank, uh, ring transition ever happened. So uh, when a page fault occurred, we never switched the stack. And if we ever got a page fault because we ran out of user stack, there would be no stack left to service that fault. And that would result in a double fault. We fixed that by using uh, IST or interrupt stack table. As you all know, through IST, we can have uh, seven per CPU exception stacks that you can jump to irrespective of whether uh, you whether there is a ring transition or not. Uh, ISTs are already used in the kernel for uh, debug purposes and NMIs, etc. We created a new exception stack and added it to the interrupt stack table. We changed the page fault entry in IDT so that any time a page fault occurred, we would have a fresh stack to service it. Another interesting problem we found out after banging our heads against the wall was the red zone issue. As you all know, red zone is a 128 byte area beneath the stack pointer uh, in, in application stacks that the application can use to store data without moving the stack pointer. And every time a syscall uh, or interrupt happens, you automatically switch to a kernel stack and this area remains unmodified. In our case, since the uh, stack switch didn't happen uh, when we entered the kernel, the kernel code would trample all over the red zone. And when it returned, the application would have garbage values in the red zone. So we fixed it by using the no red zone flag when compiling the user applications. Uh, but finding the root cause of, uh, in this case, was, let's just say, let's just say not easy. Uh, so finally, after fixing all of these issues and finally uh, fixing all of these uh, different problems, we were able to run complex applications like um, MCACHD. We were excited to run uh, experiments and collect numbers, uh, but we soon found out that we ran into problems as the load on the system increased. For example, if you created many threads or if you created, if you did a lot of memory operations uh, happen at once, uh, that would result in uh, different uh, uh, failures and panics. So Larry Woodman, who's also uh, our mentor, who's also from Red Hat, uh, uh he and is always a massive help he suggested that uh you know we should have a debug option where we uh, we always change the stack when entering the kernel to see if uh, not switching the stack was the case uh, for all these new problems that we were facing uh since we had a separate stub for each syscall making this fix was not straightforward the kernel entry and exit code had become very complicated the way we were using it and clearly we needed a rewrite so we started working on UKL version 3, which is our current version. We updated glibc and kernel uh, to uh, latest versions and started from uh, totally unmodified code bases. Instead of making changes in each and every file of glibc, uh, which wherever a syscall was made, we, change, we made changes to the syscall macros. Uh, and instead of uh, in, in those macros, instead of executing the syscall instruction, we called uh, entry syscall 64, which is the kernel entry point for syscalls. And on returning from the kernel, uh, we did an IRET instead of a SysRET. So uh, stack, uh, the, the uh, ring transition would not happen. 
Also, we threw out the UKL stub library and used the already existing kernel functionality of going through the syscall table. Uh, since we were using all uh, the existing uh, kernel code, we went through the kernel, the full kernel entry and exit paths uh, without any modification. Uh, a lot of time was spent in the entry 64.s file, uh, and we we modified slightly modified all the kernel entry points for, uh, for example, for syscalls, faults, and errors and interrupts. These uh, changes were minimal. Uh, these involved changing the uh, CS value on the stack every time we came from application code to the to the uh, to the kernel, uh, and every time we exited. Uh, we would replace this CS value back to kernel CS value so and do an IRET instead of SysRET. This uh, changing that value on stack ensured that the entry and exit code was uh, was executed without uh, us having to change anything because that code looks for the CS value on stack. Uh, we added back the changes to the uh, page fault interrupt that we had in version 2 so that we use the IST. We also added back the boot up and linker changes that we had discussed from version 1. Uh, but we were still doing a lot of our own custom uh, initializations before executing application code. Tommy, who you can see on the screen, who's my co-presenter, uh, he wanted to run complex C, C++ applications on UKL. And that code requires the full set of glibc initializations to happen, which in turn required a full set of in uh, initializations to be done in exec VE. So thanks to Tommy, he went through all this code, and uh, be because of him, we got rid of our hand one initialization code. So uh, we modified the exec VE code a little so that it ran without actually requiring an ELF file. It went through full uh, full initialization and setup uh, of the address space mm struct task struct. Um, it also copied all of the extra kernel command lines, uh, our command line arguments to the user stack and jump to the user stack before running user code, which I know, uh, uh, you know, uh, made Tommy really, really happy because he was able to run all the C, C++ applications. Uh, we jumped into glibc initializations after that, and we were able to do all, say, all uh, the full set of glibc initializations and everything worked like a charm. Um, and so this is this is what we're doing in our, uh, in our version three. We are uh, not doing our own initializations. We are following whatever is already there. Uh, so kernel does not expect a stack page fault when running kernel code because it assumes that you're on a kernel stack. Uh, so imagine we are in MMAP code and have taken a write lock on the read write. So this is this is a problem that we faced uh, in version three that we fixed. It was a deadlock problem. So imagine if we are uh, in an MMAP code uh, on on a user stack and we have taken a write lock on the read write semaphore uh, of the MM struct. Uh, if and and we are modifying the list of VMAs. If at this point we suffer a stack page fault, we go to the fault handling code. Here we try to uh, take the read lock on the MM struct semaphore without realizing uh, that uh, we already have a write lock on it. So the read lock obviously fails. Uh, at this point, we're uh, unable to take the read lock, unable to proceed. We mark ourselves as uninterruptible and wait for someone to give up that write lock so we can then be woken up. But since we are the one holding the write lock, that results in a deadlock. Uh, this was solved by a brilliant idea from Larry Woodman. In the page fault handling code, uh, we only want to take the read lock on the semaphore uh, to walk the list of VMAs and find out the VMA to which the faulting address belongs. In our case, deadlock is only caused by stack page faults. So if we know the stack uh, VMA beforehand, we don't need to take the read lock anymore. Uh, so when the thread is created, we save its stack uh, VMA in a per thread variable. In case of a page fault, we check if the faulting address belongs to that VMA. If yes, uh, then we don't take the lock. We just uh, read the VMA from uh, the value we've already saved and service the page fault normally. Uh, and if it does not belong to that uh, VMA, it's not a, a stack fault, then we just uh, follow the routine procedure. So that allowed us to, not, uh, to, to uh, fix this deadlock. Uh, because we are now most we, we are now using mostly unchanged Linux uh, uh, code, uh, the entry exit code especially, we can easily switch on and off the stack switching. Uh, so when you go to the kernel uh, code, we can easily uh, uh, change the stack and easily not change the stack. So it's a, just a config option away. We also made changes to uh, the syscall define macro in Linux uh, to define a stub for each syscall. 
So this way, every syscall gets a corresponding UKL stub with it. We use it to directly call kernel functionality without incurring entry and exit overhead. So imagine if we don't want to go through that entry exit code, we want to directly call uh, the underlying kernel functionality. We can we can bypass all that and call that stuff directly. Based on all uh, that, uh, what we had learned about Linux and glibc, we created different flavors of UKL. The first one is the simplest case where we remain in ring zero and do a switch to kernel stack uh, when executing kernel code, uh, be it syscalls, interrupts, fault handling, whatever. Uh, this is the simplest case and we run all applications with this uh, case first to see if there are any problems and then we move on to the next uh, uh, flavors. The second flavor is where we remain in ring zero and also remain on user stack all the time. We don't uh, switch to a kernel stack. The third. So, uh, would you like to field a question from Richard? Would it work? Uh, I'm sorry. Would it work to uh, sub one two eight ISP on the syscall entry path? So, uh, in the stack switch case, uh, this is about uh, red zone, right? Yes. So in the stack switch case, when we switch to the kernel stack, yes, that would solve that problem. But if we are on the same user stack all the time, we will still have to uh, use that no red zone flag. So uh, 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 yeah, the, the third flavor uh, is where uh, every thread can turn on or off a flag, which allows it to bypass this call entry and exit overhead. Uh, it can call the internal function uh, kernel functionality directly. This is helpful when application has some performance sensitive part of the code and it just uh, wants to get done with it uh, very quickly and not incur the entry exit overheads. So uh, uh, the number of lines modified for each case is also small and this gives us hope that maybe such a small set of changes can potentially be accepted upstream. Um, hopefully, we'll see in the future when uh, UKL is a little more mature. But as you can see, uh, all uh, 380 to 500 lines uh, changed in Linux, uh, and all the changes in glibc now are also limited to a separate subdirectory. So uh, as our understanding of the Linux kernel and glibc has grown, the number of changes required has also gone down. Uh, we are in a very nice place right now where UKL can run complex ap applications and we're really excited to uh, see what is next. Uh, we ran a simple uh, memcached D experiment. Uh, uh, so uh, it shows that the memcached uh, D running normally on Linux in the blue line and uh, that totally unchanged memcached D compiled uh, as different versions of UKL. All instances are running inside QMU KVM on six cores, while the client runs on a different physical node with uh, lots of different, uh, lot, uh, with large number of threads uh, sending memcached D requests to this server. This graph shows uh, the 99 percentile tail latency and also shows the 500 microsecond SLA line in black. So uh, any line which remains under that 500 microsecond uh, mark for the longest is actually performing the better. So it can uh, service more queries per second while staying under that SLA. Uh, this result, again, should only be interpreted as a proof of functionality. Uh, it shows us promise, but at this point, we should not look at the numbers, but look at it as potential gains. Because we need a better virtualized network to get repeatable numbers without noise. Uh, when we, we, we have a high performing network, uh, I hope that this, uh, difference in the different versions of UKL and Linux will actually grow. Uh, we need to run bare metal uh, numbers to get proper numbers, uh, bare metal uh, experiments to get proper numbers. And But this at least shows that UKL can run unmodified applications and there's uh, performance benefits to be had. So uh, there's a lot of interesting uh, research directions we can ex explore. Uh, I would like to hand it over to Tommy, who's also exploring one such very interesting direction. And then we'll come back to me and we'll see what's next for the UKL project. Thanks a lot, Ali. That was awesome, man. Um, so yeah, so my name is Tom Younger. I'm a BU PhD student and a Red Hat intern. Uh, I work with Jonathan Apavu and, and Aran Krieger and the, the whole list of, of everybody that Ali introduced. Um, my main interest is in performance optimization at the operating system level. And in my work, I find that's often been done by by blurring the line between what is application and OS code. So maybe maybe blurring that line, maybe redrawing it, maybe forgetting to draw it, 
just somewhere in that space. And uh, so I got to spend some time this year hacking on UKL and uh, I've come to see it as a really fruitful project in that um, kind of wherever you look, it looks like there's, there's space for a new idea as opposed to a dead end. And uh, so I wanted to, to share with you some of the, some of the future directions and the, some of the places that I'd, I'd like to take this going forward. Uh, so what I want to get across in this talk is really two ideas. Uh, first, to flesh out this apparent tension between the standard, what I'm calling the standard process model, what we all know and love, processes running on monolithic Linux, and the unikernel model that Ali's been talking about today. Uh, so I'm claiming that there's, there's a, a tension between those two models, but it might not be as real as it, as it looks. And to do something constructive here, I want to propose a, a resolution, and that's going to come in the form of a unification of these models. And I hope to spend the rest of this talk trying to make it clear what I mean by that. So at a high level, this resolution is going to show that the process model and the unikernel model exist as extreme points on a spectrum and that there's meaningful points in between. And I can show a way that, that you can interpolate between those two points. Uh, so some background, right? Our standard process model, you're, you have two independent source bases, right? Your kernel and your application. And you're gonna throw them through a compiler to build some independent executables. Uh, so in this model, right, we can boot our OS on hardware and a VM, exec an application on top of it, and we're cooking. Now, the difference with the unikernel model, right? UKL wants you to take your unmodified source code, right? Your C and C++ code, send it through a single compilation step with a lightly modified Linux kernel. Those were insane numbers, right? Uh, I think it was 300 to 500 lines of code that were getting modified. And the goal here is that we're automatically producing an optimized unikernel executable, right? So the both sides of that divide are being compiler optimized as they move through this process together. So here's part of the tension, right? How can this humble standard process model contain, contend with these brutally fast unikernels, right? Ever, uh, Ellie just mentioned our ever T result from our group a couple of years ago, doubling the throughput of that system. The last system I worked on, SUS, and we showed that in a function as a service context, we could increase the cache density of functions by 50x, right? By using unikernel techniques together with optimizations that they enabled. Uh, and there's a ton of other results out there. Um, and sorry, here's, here's from our unikernel model, an application placed together in a single address space with the operating system components running in ring zero. Um, I think that the UKL approach here is, uh, I find it super motivating, right? That you can take your unmodified code, send it through our build process on, on the other side, you're gonna get out an executable that we claim is gonna run faster than if you had run it as a process. But let's take a minute to, uh, to consider how things look when we're multiplexing, right? Some differences are really gonna pop out here. So multiplexing processes is as natural as breathing for Linux, right? It's where the standard process model really shines right? Ease of programming, so many different types of process interaction, right? Sockets, pipes, RPCs, shared memory, file systems, right? What does it mean, though, to multiplex in the unikernel context, right? This thing is supposed to be given full dominion over a piece of hardware. It's really just not clear how to go about that. And I really ran into this this summer when I started getting interested in profiling uh, an application. Right. And the idea here was, can we jam perf together with our application into the same unikernel and use that to profile where the application is spending its time as it executes? And uh, even with some help from uh, from some of the experts in Red Hat's perf department, and this is a shout out to Yurko also if he's in the audience, uh, this proved quite difficult. Um, uh, and even if you're successful at getting these to co-run, maybe on different threads within this executable, you still have to worry about probe effects, right? So you learned about how this thing executes with perf compiled into it. What changes when perf is removed, when you actually go to deploy this thing, right? So taking another stab at, at multiplexing these, uh, 
you can certainly run each of them in their own virtual machine, right? But when it comes to, uh, to thinking about how these things are gonna be interconnected, now we're talking about VM exits just to get out of this domain, and then maybe talking across network protocols uh, to get data in between these two. And maybe it's because I'm the department extrovert, or maybe I've spent too much time working from my apartment, but this just looks kind of lonely to me, right? Like, why shouldn't one unikernel be able to leave a love note in the file system for another one, right? But, but more seriously, what if your application is comprised of multiple communicating processes, right? What if your application forks? These rich means of interactions, th this is the baby that we shouldn't throw out with the bathwater as, as we change and consider new models here. And to be explicit, the question I'm asking is, why can't we hook up one or more unikernels directly into this model and interface them much like processes do? And uh, so to try to do something constructive here, I'll, uh, I'll try to sketch out a system that might help us achieve this. Um, I've been calling this thing symbiosis, and the idea here is that we're going to allow a, a semi-permeable uh, intermeshing of application and kernel code, right? So uh, we're, we're going to try to bring these two code paths into, uh, uh, in, into each other's space in, in a controlled way. Um, and so what I'm proposing here is to run performance-optimized, unikernelized processes in the context of a richly functioning general purpose operating system. Uh, in this system, I have two entities, right? The process, which we're familiar with, and symbiotes, all right? So, so what I'm calling a symbiote is, uh, so certainly a unikernel, like what UKL is producing, that's an example of a symbiote, but so is something that lands in the spectrum between a process and a unikernel. And I'll try, to, I'll try to flesh out what I mean by that. What is that in-between space? So symbiosis allows for the co-running of symbiotes and processes, right? And it's providing this rich system call interface for, for any of these entities, unikernels included, right? Uh, out to an outside running kernel, right? And so these first two points, it's trying to resolve the shortcomings of the unikernel model, right? How can we run these in the context of other processes? Uh, how can we provide that those rich means of interconnection and communication? Uh, our last point here is allowing an iterative procedure for, uh, for taking a process and moving it down the spectrum, applying progressively more and more unikernel optimizations along the way. Uh, so how to realize this thing? I've got three steps here, right? First, we want to have this ability to escalate a normal process to, to able to transition it to running in kernel mode in ring zero. And the second piece is bit by bit, we want to compile kernel source code directly into the app, right? Into that symbiote address space. And finally, if you wanna go the whole way, you can then specialize those kernel paths to the application itself, right? So within symbiosis, right, your, your building of processes is, it looks pretty standard. You take your app, throw it through the compiler and you get out an executable. Um, and uh, similar to compiling Linux, cause this is Linux with some very small modifications, we'll compile that kernel source code and, and get out our, our symbiosis kernel on the other side. Um, Now, if you're, if you're doing a unikernel-like build, right, so we can take UKL and an app, throw that through a compiler and get out a symbiote executable. Um, but still we're doing the same thing on the other side. We still just have our, our symbiote kernel that's going to support this thing, just like it supports a process. And now here, let's deal with what's in between, right? So the idea here is that we're gonna take application source code and we're gonna try to turn this thing into a symbiote, which is taking advantage of some of these unikernel optimizations. And the idea here is that we can think of this kernel code as being comprised of a number of independent, or a number of uh, code paths. And the idea is to replicate some of those code paths into that application source, right? So maybe you've identified a really hot path, right? This system call is just getting hammered. And now the idea is we're gonna bring it into the application domain and fuse it into the application code path, 
right? Taking advantage of compile time optimizations and taking a step towards a full blown uni kernel, right? Um, and so that's system code running in the application space, right? This is gonna run in ring zero. We're not talking about a process, but simultaneously every other system call that this application makes is gonna go through the normal gates, right? So this is not by any means a hermetically sealed uni kernel either, right? And so in this sense, it's, it's living somewhere in this liminal space. So now going through those three steps, right? Escalating a process, right? So we can boot the symbiote kernel on hardware. This is essentially booting Linux, right? We just have it, we just have added to this thing the ability to elevate a process. So we boot symbi uh, symbiosis on some hardware. And let's be clear here, once that application calls escalate, there's no longer any pretense of security, right? This symbiote is in full control of the system now. It has the keys to the castle, and we're assuming a non it's non-adversarial with respect to the other processes in the system. And in this step, we've taken, we've moved out of the world of processes into the world of symbiotes, where you can make direct calls to internal kernel interfaces. Uh, we can eliminate those hardware privileged domain crossing expenses. And, uh, but keep in mind that we can still exercise that system call interface. You can still open a file, read, write, send, receive. Uh, we're trying to preserve that um, to keep those general purpose properties. So with respect to the scope, right? So we started with running uni kernels as the sole controlling entities of either a hardware node or a virtual machine. And we're just trying to broaden it out a little bit, right? You run your uni kernel and it's supporting cronies, right? Uh, it's not saying you should run a hundred applications simultaneously in this model, but maybe you could take each of those applications where each app could be multiple processes, run them in their own VMs. Uh, so, so we're just expanding that scope a little bit. So to this second piece, right, compiling system code into a symbiote, right? So this is the iterative procedure by which we can move ourselves along that spectrum from process to unikernel, right? So, and you can start with a full-blown process, profile it, find out where your time is being spent in the system, which system calls are taking the longest, and then pull those out of the kernel and up into your application, compiling them together, right? And the idea is through this process, you can uh, eliminate bottleneck after bottleneck, moving yourself to, towards a more optimized point. Now, I don't know if that sounded easy, but I, it's not at all, right? So there's a ton of challenges here, right? How do you, or, or how does your compiler know that you've grabbed that whole transitive closure, that whole function call graph that's, that's going to be hit as you traverse that system call, right? Is there virtual dispatch? Is there just indirection? How many times are you gonna get burned as you try to grab that code path? Another observation is that if you just copy the exact code, that's great, it's, it's going to work if it's, if it's sharing the same underlying kernel data structures. Right, so sharing locks, uh, synchronizing with respect to that outer running kernel. Um, but what happens as you begin to optimize that, right? And especially as you begin to specialize it, um, are, are you gonna get yourself in a lot of trouble? Now, this would be really easy if Linux were a modular library operating system, but I think there's a cool property here. There's a synergy with UKL where if we can find effective ways to modularize the components of Linux, that's going to be able to move it right back up to UKL because they're going to want to be only pulling in the components of the system that serve the app. So wrapping up here, right through this scheme, the idea is that we wind up starting with a process and enumerating many of these points in between, right? As we march down to building a full uni kernel, right? The idea being, if you replace every system call, you eventually just wind up with a full blown uni kernel. Uh, and so I'll conclude there. Uh, my email address is on the slide. Uh, if you know this is impossible, if you have a different take on it, uh, if, uh, if you just have a better idea, please share it with me. Uh, it could help me save a lot of time. Thanks. Um, Ali, I think you might be muted. True. Thanks a lot, Ami. That was really interesting. and. Uh, 
really excited to you know what's next. I'll I'll quickly in the f a couple of minutes I'll just wrap up what are other research directions that we can uh, take on with UKLV. There's still things to do. We need to run uh, micro benchmarks to test this call functionality. We need to run uh, better experiments with high speed virtual network. We need to run uh, experiments bare metal. Um, I actually ran, ran some uh, UKL bare metal numbers last night and we had some good numbers, but we need to do some hardware debugging right now to iron out, uh, out some of the co corner cases on real hardware. We need to get reproducible results and we need to have something like perf running, which attributes performance uh, differences uh, to underlying reasons. Uh, we are now at a very interesting stage. UKL is fairly solid and reliable and we are ready to explore uh, many directions. Uh, do we expect you, you can to perform better than a normal Linux uh, or do we uh, expect it to perform uh, comparable to uh, research unikernels or not? Can we surpass Linux in terms of performance, boot time, memory footprint, etc.? So it's all uh, very interesting and we are all we are at a point right now that we can explore these uh, directions. Uh, the, the interesting thing is that now, uh, uh, we can look at uh, optimizations such as uh, link time optimizations and profile driven optimizations. This is especially interesting because now we have a chance to run all the code, uh, application code, glibc code, kernel code through a single compile and link stage. What benefits can we get there? Can we shorten different code paths? Can we remove things like copy from user and copy to user? So all of this is extremely interesting. Uh, we also need to replicate some of the research done with other unikernels and see if we can get similar results. Um, community help is always welcome. We are experimenting, breaking things, and learning along the way. Please join us and help out if you are excited about UKL. And uh, our team has grown a lot since we started, and new members are always welcome. And new members have always uh, made UKL uh, better. So we, we are excited about that. Uh, thank you. I think we're just within time. Uh, thanks a lot. Thank you both very much. Uh, we appreciate your time, and that was an excellent presentation. Thank, thank you. you.